Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So last talk of the day. I'm hoping Kamara and I will be able to keep you awake for the next 20 minutes uh, and keep ourselves awake because it's been a long day for us. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Dr. Dave Lawson. I'm a teaching focus lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences in the University of Bristol. And my research background is in animal behavior and plant pollinator interactions. And I am joined today by... Hi, uh, my name's Kamara. Um, I'm a student at the University of Bristol. Um, I currently, um, in my last year of zoology, um, and I've been doing the decolonizing biological sciences project um, for just over two years. Um, so yeah. So, uh, oh, sorry, thanks, Kamara. <laughs> uh, so uh, today, Kamara and I will be uh, taking you through the journey that our school has been on through our different uh, decolonizing and diversifying activities. Uh, focusing on the student-led projects that we've been doing. So uh, it's worth starting off just acknowledging uh, who has been doing a lot of this work. So this work has been uh, done under the academic supervision of uh, myself and Dr. Celine Petitjean, and we'd like to thank the uh, Decolonizing and Diversifying Life Sciences Working Group, who have shared ethics forms, they've shared survey questions, uh, and just been an all round lovely group of people that we can bounce ideas off at all times throughout these various projects. Um, we'd like to thank Chan Shi Lu as well, who's a PhD candidate uh, in Bath School of Education, who's been helping us with our focus groups and survey analysis, and as well, the students galore who have been helping us at each stage of these different student led projects that we'll highlight throughout the talk. Um, so now Dave and I will talk about why decolonization is important to us. Um, my experience being a black queer individual in, at university has meant that I've, I've had to hide and conceal aspects of myself. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't been safe to, to express the entirety of my being and so I've had to shrink myself to progress in this world. Um, racism, sexism, transphobia, uh, all of these injustices within our society affect what knowledge we value and, and how we go about sharing them. And it harms those who engage with this education system. Um, colonization has, has influenced our curriculum and and we prioritize western knowledge um, and idolize it as the the best and only knowledge that we we can we can value um, and i i i need a world i need education and a world where people like me and everyone can feel seen and heard and safe and appreciated um, so that's why i i do this work Thanks, Kamara. Um, so in terms of why uh, these projects are important to me as uh, an individual and as an educator, so the, the, motiv the motivations have been coming from all angles, really. So there's this commitment from the senior management team at the university to decolonize our um, curricula, as well as calls from individual students like Kamara and from the SU. Uh, to decolonize curricula in the university alongside this global movement to to decolonize uh, and address uh, wider inequalities and to some extent if i'm being honest i see a lot of these as uh, as should motivations which isn't necessarily the best form of of motivation um, although it's motivating nonetheless, but there are, are some motivations that come from a, a more joyful place inside me. And these are to um, the desire for me to, for my students to see themselves reflected in their course. Uh, for me personally, to just have a greater awareness of what I'm teaching, why I'm teaching in the way that I'm teaching and how this shapes students' experience and students' belonging. Um, 
and also wanting to be part of uh, an educational culture that's not shying away from these really important topics. Uh, so that's why it was lovely when a shiny pot of money presented itself um, in the school uh, for teaching development, which allowed us to pounce on this uh, opportunity to then uh, start this ball rolling uh, in the project. So uh, with this pot of money, we then had to decide what decolonization meant for us as a school. And as we all know, uh, uh, now through this day, uh, this means different things to different people. Uh, but we didn't want to tell our staff that they were doing anything wrong. But we want what we were framing this around is highlighting opportunities for our staff to improve that they're teaching. And we uh, kind of came up with the following as areas that could be highlighted in the curriculum or in teaching content. So this is to uh, acknowledge the contributions of individuals or groups that have been overlooked, uh, to discuss the problematic past of some of our subjects key features and in biological sciences, we have plenty of those to choose from, um, to include some more diverse perspectives in our teaching and as well to acknowledge power relations between the global south and the global north, um, which intersects quite a lot with uh, biological sciences, particularly in uh, areas like ecology and conservation. Um, so we uh, um, attempted to explore these aims in our first project on decolonizing the curriculum, which began in the summer of 2021. Um, funded by the University of Bristol's Biological Sciences um, group. Um, so the project entailed curriculum audits. Um, so this is uh, where we, the five student curriculum developers that are on the board, including myself, uh, critically analyzed the teaching material which was available um, within the school um, to, to see what knowledge was being, was being like valued and, and shared and how lecturers could create space for discussion around how colonization has impacted science and uh, voices um, that have gone unheard. Um, so creating room for that. We also decided to carry out surveys to uh, understand what the perceptions were within our staff and students on colonization, um, decolonization, uh, white privilege, Eurocentrism, like topics relating um, to this project. Um, and then these uh, are all summarized into a report that Dave will talk about later in the talk. <laughs> um, so how to audit the curriculum. This was the process that um, the student curriculum developers went through. Um, so first, we critically reviewed the reading lists, lectures, and practical materials that were available, and through research um, on the broader topics such as ecology and conservation, molecular biology, agriculture, we identified um, areas of blindness within the teaching material, um, and through recognizing that, were able to suggest ways in which the lecturers could acknowledged the problematic figures and um, their history and the, the context behind this science, but also highlight any overlooked figures um, and as an overall uh, greater discussion on how coloniality still presently impacts science. I'll just give the HDMI cable a little jiggle just in yeah. case that's what's doing the flickering. Cool. Cool. Lovely. <laughs> um, so Kamara talked about some of the uh, different aspects of the projects that the student curriculum developers were focusing on, like these uh, student surveys and the staff surveys and these curriculum or unit uh, audits. So these fed through primarily into two different outputs, the first of which is this uh, school report. So this was a report that was really tailored to our school and the different information that's taught within it. So within the report, it identified some key areas that were in need of attention in our curriculum, those mainly being uh, evolution and genetics, um, agricultural 
um, technology. And the third one has just ecology and conservation. Ecology and conservation. <laughs> Thanks, Kamara. Um, so alongside these, the students and Celine put together a number of lecture slides as well. So uh, these are lecture slides that are designed for academic staff to use, uh, are focusing on some of these key areas and how these slides work is essentially on the left hand side, you have some content that can be included in lecture materials. So uh, for instance, this could be uh, additional historical context, it could be information about a hidden figure that has been overlooked. Um, and then on the right hand side of the slides is how that content could be integrated into a teaching activity, whether that's uh, just a slide dedicated to it, um, adding additional context to a pre existing slide, a short discussion with students. So, different ways that these things can be put in place. So this was us really uh, putting on a silver platter some improvements that could be made for our um, to our staff's teaching, with the idea being that sure they can use these to make their teaching better, but maybe more importantly than that, it will hopefully start to foster some kind of reflection on what the staff are putting into their teaching or what things that they're highlighting. So we were hoping that this would um, promote a, a longer term cultural shift as well. So just to highlight some of the findings from our student surveys, so 62% of our students reported uh, um, an experience of Eurocentrism in the curriculum. So the majority of our students are recognizing that there is this bias towards the Western biological canon. Um, but the majority of our students are open to exploring decolonization in their teaching. Uh, and one interesting thing that we pulled out was that it was the units that already discussed uh, topics around Eurocentrism and racial inequality that were actually highlighted as, oh, let me do another little HDMI table. Um, it was these units that were actually identified as being the ones that would benefit the most from more discussion. Uh, so it seemed the more the students knew uh, about a particular topic and how it intersected with Eurocentrism or inequalities, the more they wanted to know or the more they kind of recognized that importance. And another thing we pulled from this is some differences between the different year groups. So uh, years one and two had a, a greater perceived confidence in their understanding of colonial history in compare, compared to the third and fourth years. And although the, the majority of our students identified the importance of uh, decolonizing and diversifying the curriculum, the years one and two didn't consider decolonizing the curriculum as important as the third and fourth years. And a small minority of the first and second years didn't see the relevance of decolonization in their course at all. So it seemed that as the students are progressing through their learning journey, they're getting a more nuanced idea of their course or perhaps um, seeing it more as something that can be challenged and not something that is just this perfectly formed thing that they get taught. So from uh, the survey results, uh, in our next student project, we, we shifted the student role around a little bit. So rather than our student curriculum developers, we broadened this role out to our student decolonization partners role. Uh, and part of this role profile, well, there were three aspects to it, which we identify as the three R's. So the first of these R's is, is representation. So acting as a point of contact for our students uh, so that other students can get in touch uh, with them or staff can get in touch with them if uh, there's something to be discussed or something identified and liaising between staff and students on these topics. Then there's the research component. And this is about, uh, learning more about our particular units or what we teach and the culture within our school alongside more wider research looking at the literature and what kind of things could be included into our curriculum and finally there's reach as well so these student partners liaising with other students and staff in the uh, in the faculty in the wider university and with organizations and staff and students beyond uh, the university of bristol
So we explored the three R's in our second project, which started in um, the academic term of 2021 into 2022. Um, and this was funded by the Bristol Institute of Learning and Teaching, um, work carried out by Sophia Salaki and I. Um, so we continued on with the surveys from the first project, um, just to continue monitoring the perceptions of decolonization within our school. Um, but we also included um, focus groups as a more personalized approach to understanding um, different students' experiences at university um, and also gain insight into ideas in which um, ideas they had um, in how we could expand and um, grow from this project. Um, with addition to the surveys and focus groups, we also had a pop-up cafe bio session. Um, and so this is where Sophia and I, including Dave, were present in the life sciences building, and we can have an we could have an open discussion with students who are also um, a part of life sciences and talk about the project, the importance of the project, and how they could participate um, with a volunteer sign-up sheet. Um, a, a big focus for this project was um, creating a safe collaborative space. Um, to the blackboard space um, so this is a virtual space where we provided um, resources um, such as articles papers podcasts videos on topics relating to decolonization so students and staff could um, gain uh, a better understanding of the project um, but also um, a uh, one of the, the main aspects of this page was a manifesto in the making so we didn't want to have um, a hierarchy on like our ideas of what decolonization is and exclude anyone else's um, um, experiences or our ideas on what they thought decolonization was and how um, uh, they how we could we, we didn't want any voices to go unheard essentially we wanted to make sure everyone felt included in this process um, and seen and so our, our aims are for this project are constantly evolving with the engagement of staff and students. Um, yeah. um, and so then we go on to our third project, um, which we begun um, this year going on into the next year, um, work that we carried out by Keisha, Lisa and I. Um, so um, we've titled this diverse, uh, diversifying and decolonizing the curriculum because we recognize the differences between that um, and how um, diversifying is important, um, an, an important aspect of decolonization, but it isn't the only aspect of decolonization. Um, this project was also um, funded by the Bristol Institute of Learning and Teaching, thankfully. Um, and in this project, we are focusing on creating a demographic of researchers and ideas suggested by Sinead English, which is um, a teaching staff at the School of Biological Sciences. Um, as STEM, STEM staff, uh, STEM staff would value quantitative information on who is teaching um, this um, learning material. Um, but also we wanted to uh, kind of expand our ideas on how we teach knowledge and like, and for, for example, like why is a lecture the way it is? Why is it one person sharing knowledge to a group of people and there is no discussion and debate? And so um, we wanted to, yeah, expand our views on like, how we teach content through like creative groups. So we're not just um, reading material or, or um, looking at research, but we're looking at artifacts or videos or other like creative ways in which people um, express their findings, um, uh, which they will go into. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that we're most excited about this, this next phase is embedding decolonization into the curriculum. So although we want, uh, decolonization as a lens to, through which we can look at all of our teaching. Uh, here is an opportunity that we can actually have a session dedicated to the topic. Uh, so this is a workshop for our current topics in biology unit. Uh, so this is a session designed in collaboration with students like Kamara alongside uh, Lara Lalemi, who's a PhD candidate in the School of Chemistry at the University of Bristol, uh, who has uh, who uh, leads an organization called Creative Tuition, and she speaks really passionately about the topic of decolonization. So I urge you to look her up. 
So what we're planning for this session is to um, explore how current biological research is embedded within and informed by uh, colonial influences and to identify ways in which current biological research, research practices could be included, so it could be improved, so that our students are kind of armed with a toolkit so that as they graduate, they can go out into the, the biological sphere and be part of a better future or be empowered to do so. And as well, further explore these power imbalances like those between the Global South and the Global North with an associated essay assessment. So like Kamara said, one of the things we're, we're exploring with this session is uh, how we can actually go about the session itself and the classroom and uh, the teaching of it in a uh, decolonial way. Um, so here are a few suggestions um, that we came up with and have used to um, start the process of decolonizing our curriculum. Um, but I won't go into depth with them now. So Dave and I will be here during dinner. So feel welcome to come to us and we can discuss them further. So alongside that, um, we'd just like to give special thanks to those on the board, like the Bristol Institute of Teaching and Learning, uh, the <laughs> Faculty of Life Science, um, and the Life Sciences Decolonizing Diversifying Working Group, um, alongside Chanchi, who we mentioned earlier, and our Merry League of Student Partners. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.